G'day everyone and a welcome to another episode of Aussie Tech Heads. Yes, you've tuned into the best podcast in the world. How are you going? It's the 18th of October 2018 and it's episode 606. So we're pump, pumping those episodes out, aren't we? Uh, I'm Glenn Goodman and I welcome you to yet another week. We are brought to you by ATHwebhosting.com.au, our drag and drop website builder free for pro and business plans. The service are SSD drives, immediate activation. So you want to build a web page at 12 midnight, you can sign up and and do your thing at 12 midnight if you like you know jump out of bed can't sleep whatever you want to do uh aussie support maybe not at 12 midnight but <laughs> maybe pretty soon after uh domain registration easy install wordpress joomla and drupal so go and give them a give us a bit of a go there and also uh start new company.com.au register your company fast and easy and direct with asic so all you have to do is complete your information on the site and it will send away to asic you get the certificate and all your company constitution and all that sort of good stuff uh right in your inbox pretty much straight away as soon as ASIC can uh, computers get around to doing it which is pretty instantly uh, you get all the stuff uh, ready to go and you can walk out the front door and start trading as your new company startnewcompany.com.au all right let's get straight into it because we have a few stories to get through tonight and let's uh, see who's here it's the usual suspects of course and Joe's first he can't, he's first in the line all the time hey Joe hey Glenn how you going yeah not too bad thanks how's your week been uh, it's been pretty good pretty busy yeah, excellent, excellent. Uh, any, um, shall we say, uh, I don't know, <laughs> any requests for more discos? No, not at the moment. That's not going to happen until next year now. Right, okay. You have a bit of a break? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Did you enjoy yourself, though? I did. I actually loved it. It was a great event. I loved it. Yeah, you would have been busy. Did you have any help when you were doing it, or was just you just flitting around all over the place, music, lights, sound? Um, when, when everything was already set up, um, after that, uh, I did get help with setting up, but after that, it was all on my own. Yeah, right. Yep, good stuff. Did well. And uh, Jordan, how are you going, Jordan? Oh, he's muted himself. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I did mute myself. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm good. That's I, good. Um, I had, uh, and I must say that Joe's always first in line because I'm always running late. So he's, he's always the first. That to must connect. be what it is. That's what it is. But I had a great great week this week i went down to the local music night and got up in public for the second time and played guitar and sang i'm pretty happy about oh, that's that. well you were learning guitar so that's going good for you yeah i started was my new year's resolution was in january to learn guitar so i can do some solo gigs just sit and play and sing by myself so and i did last week got up and sang at this local music night right. first time and then this week again so yeah. i'm just going to keep doing that for a few more weeks until i'm ready to go out and do an actual geek by myself excellent excellent let me tell you about how you can contact us it's, you can contact us at youtube.com forward slash aussie tech heads well, i suppose you can watch us probably leave a message or a little thing uh or, or facebook.com forward slash aussie tech heads uh the podcast web page is at aussie tech forward slash podcast we see all the show notes amongst a couple of other things you can grab the audio and the video from there as well uh other podcasts around on the Network, I guess, Aussie Max Zone, My Tech Opinion, and the Aussie Tech Crypto. So uh, make sure you check out, uh, get your eyes peeled for those ones. And you can contact me at glenn at aussietechheads.com.au. You can get uh, Jordan at jordan at aussietechheads.com.au and Joe at Joe the Gadget Man. No, you can't. Joe at aussietechheads.com.au. That's right. <laughs> but if Joe does have a website. Well, I'm uh, glad he has an Aussie Tech Heads email. Glenn, that's that is everyone's privileged having that. Oh, no, everyone, everyone's got one. You know, this is what happens. Everyone gets one. Everyone gets an email. <laughs> It'll be like a hotmail soon. You better start giving them out to everyone. Oh, that's right. That's right. Uh, so, Joe, what, what's your website? Uh, my website is joethegadgetsman.com. And you got a, what? which one, what's the, where can people find the best info? Is it Facebook, YouTube, or the website? At the moment, if, it's better if you follow me on the Facebook. Uh, the website is going to have a update soon so it's going to look a little bit different in the next couple of weeks i'm going to change the way it looks nice so at the moment um if anyone wants to follow me they can follow me on the facebook which is facebook.com forward slash joe the gadget man now your youtube channel you're always looking for subscribers at youtube.com forward slash joe the gadget man excellent excellent we'll have to get like a little ad or something up for a little square up on the aussie tech Ed page for you joe yeah, we can organise that sometime. Yeah, I was, I was trying to. I was trying to talk to you, Glenn, earlier about promo gear. I was, and, and that's what I was oh, yes. thinking. Maybe that's what we need. We need something, you know, like a, a Joe the Gadgets Man T-shirt or something that you can mm. give away. Well, I know, know uh, Michael from For, the Mac Zone. He's uh, he got a couple of 
these done. Just some Aussie tech head giveaways or something, you know? Yeah. Michael got some cups done. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, I think you can get those on Vista Print. Uh, if you want one, they're pretty expensive for one. I think oh, it might be seven bucks, but you st- and you've got to pay another ten or something for postage. Best if you get more. But uh, but yeah, like they're pretty cool. But sure, you can get everything on that Vista print, can't you? It's bloody crazy. But uh, yeah, so I did. Yeah, have, you can. It's great. I did have shirts years ago. I still got them. I didn't. I didn't sell them all. But I still got some shirts. But uh, it's got the old. I used to be AussieTechHeads dot com, and then um, so the shirts got printed with the dot com. And, but now I'm uh, .au, so there you go. I still got the shirts. Maybe I should just have a giveaway. I'll probably yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, have just, a giveaway. Just, just get rid just, of them. You know? Yeah. You know? We could, I don't know, maybe come up with something that, and you can then post it out to one of the listeners for, for some reason. We'll work it out. I'll give the shirt away if you guys pay for the postage. How's that? <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll, I'll organise something for the, for the uh, giveaway on the Aussie Tech Heads page, and then, sure, no worries. All right. Okay. Well, hold your horses. We might have some some t shirts coming. Uh, okay. Let's and then and then to follow it up, you can have dinner with Glenn, uh, a special date date night with Glenn. Oh. Can that can that go out as well? Yeah, oh, I've got special <laughs> slippers for date nights with the with the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, yes. Good. Now, where are we going to start? Oh, look, we, let's start with some stories and uh, probably a sad story, I guess. Uh, Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen has died, only 65, which is no good. Uh, he co-founded Microsoft with Bill Gates in 1975, left the company in 1983 after he was diagnosed with Hodgkinson's disease. I'm not too sure what that does, but it's a, some form of cancer, I think. Um, oh, is this little video? I'll see if I can play the video here for people on the... On the on the uh, videos, might oh, it's just going to be a news report by a little bit. Uh, yeah, so Forbes had listed uh, Paul Allen as the twenty first richest person in the world, worth twenty point three billion uh, as of fifteenth of October. Through Vulcan, which must have been one of his companies, he owned the NFL Seattle Seahawks and the NBA's Portland Trail Blazers. So, um, yeah, so he obviously uh, liked his sport. The Allen, uh, he also did also, the Vulcan through him also owned the Strato Launch Systems, the, the Allen Institute and the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. So I guess when you're worth $20.3 billion, you've got a bit of money to splash around, haven't you? So, mm. Yeah, you can afford to do a thing or two. Yeah, he was uh, apparently like he was a childhood friend of Bill Gates. Um, yeah, and Bill Gates was reportedly, you know, yeah, well, as you would imagine, really upset. And sixty-five is just too young to go, isn't it? Like, it is a bit. Yeah, it is a bit. No good at all. Like, yeah, that's not good at all. That's uh, really sad. But anyway, it's uh, life goes on, I guess. And uh, thanks to him and Bill, that we are bringing you this podcast right now, I guess, on the Windows machine. So it wouldn't be possible without those guys. Yeah. Uh, all right. That's that's yeah. I thought I'd. Uh, Get that one, the importance at the top story of the show that it probably deserves. Uh, any comments or we move on from that? No, nah, Rip Paul. Yep. All right. Uh, let's go and see what Joe's got in his little bag of stories. <laughs> Open up that bag of stories, Joe. What's in there? Okay. This week I've got this um, report that says that um, the IoT security in people's homes are simply not, not good enough. Hmm. I think that's yeah. been going around a while, hasn't it? Yeah, look, there's a company called A Lot Communications, um, and they're a global provider of network intelligence and security solutions uh, for both the um, service providers and for enterprises. And they've said that the consumers are just not happy today with all the kind of stuff that they're getting in their um, home, in their connected home. They're just saying that the security on them is just not good enough. Yeah, so I guess, uh, so who's saying that? Consumers? We, the consumers? Yeah, the consumers, us. Yeah, just the consumers. Apparently, there's an average of 8.4 connected devices um, in your home, and uh, that could be smartphones, tablets. Um, they make up the majority of it. But you also got to include things like the, uh, the, the Bluetooth devices, and some of them are legacy, some of them are the older type Bluetooth devices, and some of the old Wi-Fi devices. Right. Uh, um, those, those, those older, older ones have got old firmware in them and yep. they're much easier to get hacked by hackers should they um, 
should they want to, you know... Well, we had that story, I think, last week, wasn't it, where California was going to mandate that all the all these devices, all Wi-Fi device, devices, had to have a changeable password. Uh, so, you know, that's probably a step towards something because, you know, I think, at the, you know, there was that problem with baby monitors, you know, just hard-coded um, admin, admin, pa- username, password and stuff like that. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly what I'm talking about. There's all these little devices out there that when they're first built, there's little to no security on them. Mm. And um, what they're saying is that, okay, you've got a smart home and you've got all the security and stuff, but at the same time, a hacker, should they want to, easily infiltrate your system and get into your system. Yeah, well, that's right. They come in through the baby monitor and then, yeah, once they're in, they're in, aren't they? Like, I noticed here one of those points in that story was 72% of households are willing to pay a monthly fee averaging $5.26. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think that I think where they're going with that is that they're trying. This company here um, is is trying to collaborate with some service providers and offer it as a um, a service, so that when the updates are like a Windows update, for example, when Windows needs to be updated, it sends out a request to all the devices. Yeah, and yeah. then it updates. So I think they're going to try and do. They're trying to try and work with um, different service providers and with. Um, different enterprise customers to try and set up some sort of system like that. And I reckon that's a great idea. But I think it's going to add another layer of complexity, though. Could, could you imagine, you know, mum gets home from the shop with the new baby monitor, and before she can use it, she's got to plug it into the internet, she's got to log into its interface and start changing passwords. Like, you know, it's another yeah. layer, isn't it? Which well, that's, that's the same as when you go and buy your phone. And it's been sitting in the in the warehouse for about three, four, six months before you actually get it. Mm. So they, they have to do updates as soon as you get them. So I, I think it's a good thing. They should they should um, somehow collaborate with the internet providers or have some sort of automated system that as soon as it it connects to the um, to the network at home, yeah, then it gets updated. Now half the problem is that there's a lot of products out there that are not internet enabled, right? And that's where the problem is, right? They can't be updated. Yeah, uh, the right. people who actually own these devices don't have the, the knowledge or even the know-how of what to do um, to be able to upgrade them. So um, what I've found is that there's a lot of them sitting around in people's homes, old, um, you know, wireless routers, access points, yep. things of that nature that, you know, it really should be tossed out rather sure sure they work and everything's fine but they should really be tossed out mm. for the simple fact of the security behind it well there'd be no doubt that i'd have unsecured devices around here um you know uh i don't know what what they could be but like there's i've got you don't well, you get these apps on your phone uh, i'm not sure what one's called fring i think on the iphone and it, it will scan your network and tell you what's on there and like well, i scan my network I've got like 32 devices come up and just go what you know and you start counting them and you go oh yeah the you know you got the chromecast you got your apple um airport whatever you got your phones you've got your tablets you've got your your routers uh what else have you got you've got uh, like the little codies you've got just everything seems to be just jamming into the wi-fi i've got the wi-fi access points yeah it's crazy i had about like 32 come up on my list so there's obviously some uh, unsecure ones in there but uh yeah, so that's interesting. Like, but oh, interesting to see that people would actually pay, say, sixty bucks a year. Uh, I don't know how they. Yeah, what what some software comes out. Yeah, look, this is just an idea at the moment. I don't think they actually implemented it yet. They're just saying that some people are willing to pay up to that much money mm. to have their service. Yeah, well, people are paying. That'd be on average how much an antivirus software uh, thing would cost you about sixty bucks a year. So that's pretty average there. Uh, to do to secure the whole house, yeah, to, yeah, there must be something you can do to, uh, st- you know, maybe easily, maybe more easily whitelist devices th- through MAC addressing. But I guess the MAC addresses can be spoofed as well, can't they? You know, if, if someone yeah, wants to just get the in. The way I see it, uh, the way I think it should be going is that they should somehow at that um, router level. Um, yes. Yeah. Somewhere at that level, that they should be able to talk to the device and at that point say a notification or something come up on the say hey listen this is out of date mm. needs to be updated so um, something like there is, 
there is routers that do that though that, that do update yeah that's right but i'm talking more specifically into iot devices or if you have a uh, a wireless cam for example that's been sitting in the, in the outside in the garage for for, for you know, years and years and it works fine there's nothing wrong with it you don't mind it it's not 1080p or anything like that it just works fine mm. but because it's a wireless one um it's it's easily um hackable from someone who's got the uh, the right equipment to be able to do that you can get routers that can, uh, uh routers that are like got this firewall built into them that uh that get their information from like a third party so uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember off the top of my head now what that brand is that I n- know. But say like there's a company somewhere that so if they identify a threat, they know what IP addresses. Or it's like it's a real time update of issues on the internet, and then that is just a real time push to all the connected of their routers. You know, so like if say Joe, your IP started sending out spam, for example, continuously for two days, say they'd be alerted. They put your IP into their machine, and then all the routers that subscribe to that service for them, they won't. Sh- they they'll just refuse your IP requests or anything from your IP so things like that. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. I think that happens at the service provider level. Um, they used to, I, I used to work at Optus, and and I used to actually work in cable internet as well there at Optus. At Optus. Right. They had this um, this service there that detected whether there was viruses coming out from any particular um, home. So yeah. what they did was that once they had identified that this device or this uh, service at this email address at this particular home was sending out like hundreds or even thousands of spam mails every day, the provider would then block that service, and that would uh, enforce the person to call in and find out like why is it not working yeah that way they tell them okay well we'll stop your service because you need to know uh, if you're unaware of it that the um that you're actually sending out all this spam mail or viruses are coming through so they do have that at the service provider level i know that yeah so i, I think the email might have been a bad example to use just there but uh i'm just trying to think of uh, what this what this one yeah, the, the other thing is that some devices like routers and stuff they can also implement some sort of um, antivirus or some sort of security software within them. And they, um, like Jordan was saying, that they, they can actually do that at that level. There's also, I think they should also implement the IoT security at that level as well. And that could be done by you know, Norton or any other company that, that provides virus protection. Mm. That could be able to, that could be like an added feature or an added add-on or another app that they can install to that particular product that would able to enable them to protect them themselves. What's that service called where you can subscribe to it uh, and you can set the certain settings and they'll automatically filter out like porn sites and all that sort of stuff. There's free and paid versions. I can't think of it now. You use it for your... Oh, there's, there's, what, there's one called Net Nanny or something like that? Yeah, it'd be something like that, yeah. I can't think of the one that I used to use. I've got one set up from the kids at the moment. It just basically, it just runs a VPN pretty much. And then once you're in the VPN, they, they have thousands of sites blocked. Right, yeah. I can't... Yeah, this one, oh, I can't remember. I've got a... Net Nanny is a kind of an example of that. Yeah, mm. I can't think now which one i got a oh i can't believe i can't think of that the name of that thing it was like something like it's not any dns it's something something similar to that where you you change your dns on your router to them and then any requests that the your goes back through them and then they right. tell you whether it's right or wrong yeah if they're flagged the porn site or whatever uh then they just don't let that site go through but anyway uh, alan says it's open dns is that the one it could be it could be. Uh, let me have a look. Open the. See, I use um, with with my kids. I found a new app um, called uh, Ki- Kids Locks. K i d s l o x. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and as soon as you turn that on, it just sets up a VPN in Apple. It sets like in the iPhone. It sets up a VPN, but I think in the um, I'm not sure how it does it in Android, but yeah, this is so yeah. then you're just in that network that they have cleaned. Yeah, that's good. Open this open DNS. Who, who said that? It was Alan. He was he left a comment saying that it was open DNS. Good on you, Alan. That's what it is. Um, Im- yeah, improve your internet. That's right. Yeah, but anything like that, and I think there's a free version uh, as well, paid version. But yeah, that that's uh, that's that's worked for me in the past. That's really good. Uh, all right. Uh, any more on that one, Joe? No, that's it. That's all I needed to know. Um, 
All right. So, yeah. all right. So, just staying with that type of uh, flavour, let's go with Apple will let users see and delete data that it has collected. So, I guess yes. like, uh, well, maybe similar to Facebook. I think Facebook, you're able to download all the data that they've collected. I'm not sure you can delete it, though. I think in the, remember in the old well, the old days, about, I don't know, five years ago, when you did it, they used to, instead of downloading it, they used to burn it all to a CD and send it to you. You know, I'm sure they're not doing that anymore. But Apple has rolled out an online tool to uh, users to download, change, or delete all the data that the iPhone has collected. So Apple updated its privacy website with the tool, which was unveiled earlier this year for users in the EU in response to their this GDPR thing. Now, I'm sure everyone's seen or heard about this GTBR thing, because every website you go to sort of mentions it, mentions it doesn't it? Uh, so Apple will now let users in the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand see and download all information that Apple has collected on you. So what information would that be? Uh, Apple devices such as iPhones, Apple Watches collect detailed data about users such as email, call or text messages, biometric data, heart rate, and fingerprint. But uh, Apple, what they've been doing is, you know, instead of storing that the, uh, instead of storing that data in the cloud or on the Apple servers, the most of that data is actually stored on the device, and which is also then like double double encrypted with your key passcode. So it's uh, so if your passcode is five 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 five, then that data that, that I've just said uh, that's encrypted using that passcode so sort of you know and and apparently apple has said that uh once it's encoded with the user's passcode apple does not possess the data and cannot unscramble it uh even if asked so by law enforcement officials so you know it seems to be pretty secure they've previously offered uh these functions in different places but brought them together for the eu privacy laws it plans to roll out the same year around the world but uh, that's around the world but just, that's apparently you can do that now be interesting wouldn't it so I wonder if you could just like download it and see, you know, what your heart rate was, I don't know, last year on 2nd of October or something like that. Or maybe on the 1st of October 2016 when the Sharks win the grand final off the charts. Yes. So um, that's pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, your heart would have been pumping. It was pumping. Very exciting. <laughs> would have blown it up. <laughs> so, yeah. So, it's also, I must admit, I, I don't mean to be negative, but it must admit, you know, these security things that they say they're doing often can be a marketing pitch to make you feel more comfortable. Oh, I'm sure it is. They've had a, they've had a lot you know? of uh, bad press about security issues of late, haven't they? Yeah, so if they turn around and go, oh, we're, we're doing this and we're letting you have all your data and we're showing you what we protect and what we don't, it certainly makes the uh, customer feel more comfortable, doesn't it? Well, well does it? Though, like, what well, you know, like they go, oh yeah, it'd be good to see what they've recorded on me. So you get this twenty gig file, and you go, oh, they've got that as well. Where I have been, maybe I've been to places I shouldn't have been, and all that sort of stuff. I wonder, you know. I remember a, a long time ago when I was reviewing the, the password um, software applications, and and I came across LastPass, yes. and um, and I was like, oh, this looks really good, and and there was nothing but great reviews about it and then someone's one of the reviews i said read said that they had been hacked once just once that's before. right and and the, the way last pass handled it was to tell everyone and be honest about it say we did and the hackers didn't get through and we're just telling you so you know about it yes well there's not much else you can do <laughs> If you get act, and it makes you wonder, is that a good thing to say? Well, we're just we're just letting you know that we're on top of it and we won, um, and everything's good. Or is that just you know, or do you hide it? I think you know? by law, and especially in Australia, I think it is by law. If you have a certain size company, and I don't think it's too big, that if you have got a breach, you have to like you have to notify the the privacy commissioner within like twenty four hours or something, and you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do, you jump through a hundred hoops and dive under a few ropes and swim through a lake and all this sort of stuff. It's uh it's pretty serious stuff. Like if, if so, I'd say LastPass is probably by law that they've done that. I don't think if they weren't compelled, I don't know if anyone would admit to a breach. Uh, I don't know. No, probably not. But it's, I think it's kind of a good a good. It's almost reverse psychology. I think it's. I mean, that's one of the one of the reasons I went with them was because I thought, well, you know, they've got good scores, just like all these other ones. But these guys are honest and they've let us know. You know? Yeah, and what you'll find, some you know, sometimes you just. I log, took that as a positive. 
you log into a site sometimes and you'll just find that, oh, change password. Yeah, hmm, <laughs> something's happened. And so, mm. yeah, you've got to change your password. And, mm. um, but, you know, the, I think you can only try your best, can't you? Like, there's hackers are trying their way into everything every second of the day. Uh, mm. No matter what sort of walls you put up, they're going to get broken down sooner or later. So, mm. I guess you just got to keep moving. You've got to be one step ahead, haven't you, in front mm. of the hackers. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, Joe, did you have anything, Jordan, or are you just flying by the city pants? I am kind of flying by the city pants, but I did have a, a one I found just while you were talking before, if you want me to. It's just a small one. Yep, sure. It just says that um, Winamp is back. Oh, Winamp. Good stuff. And I know Joe's been using Winamp, hasn't he? I think. I have, yep. Yeah, I've been using box. that in my jukebox. It says the legendary uh, media player popular with users in the late 1990s and early 2000s is expected to return in the form of a new mobile application bringing together all of the users' music streaming services and podcasts according to the website TechCrunch. Uh, bought by the Belgian company uh what is it, Radio Radio Wami in 2014, in which Vived Endi, whatever that is, now has a majority stake. Uh, Winamp still exists as a desktop media player for PC and Mac, however, on old mobile versions of Android has been long abandoned. Uh, now the idea to resurrect Winamp for mobile with an app offering users access to all audio in one place from music files stored on their smartphones to music from their streaming sites as well as the internet radio stations and podcasts. Yeah, well, I don't know. Um, why did Winamp die? They obviously didn't make any money, but it used to be, it's an oldie but a goodie, isn't it? Oh, Winamp. It was great. Yeah. I, I reckon it was fan- It was one of the best, in my opinion, back in the day. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I used that. It was good. It's good to see it's coming back. They said it's not expected to land on Android or iOS till 2019. So, and I think they, it says also that they're negotiating with streaming services right. so that they can, you know, if they want to make a good comeback, they've got to have all these streaming services and stuff involved. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that's... To make it strong, you know. Yeah, I'll be looking out for that. I've, I, always, uh... I used to love the... Um, I used to love the way that it, it, um, it mixed songs together. You know, the auto DJ feature that a lot of these music programs has like even spotify has has the auto dj function it kind of takes out the silence between songs and mixes them together yeah and um i think the one of the plugins that winamp had many years ago and i don't know whether it's the same um i don't know i don't think it's the exact same plugin that they eventually built into winamp because it never had it but the external one was based on on the db levels of, of songs so when it got to a certain volume right. it would then automatically mix in the next song rather than and time and everything all together rather than yes. however some of them do it now they kind of analyze it weirdly and it doesn't always work out you get confused with mana mana mm. no when to come in for the next song <laughs> <laughs> but then you know i heard only a couple of years ago that spotify bought winamp or something to do with winamp i can't remember yeah right yeah, okay, maybe maybe there is some of that behind it. Maybe a bit of some sort of, yeah, big engine that's going to come from behind. And give Who it, knows? Give it a push. But I used to love good old Winamp. Yeah, it was that good. Was, that was a good old reliable system back in the day. Yeah, that's a good story. A good news story. Um, what else, Joe? Okay, what um, a lot of people don't know is that the Sydney Harbour Bridge has 2,400 sensors and it has also some machine learning models that are monitoring the bridge every day. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. No, I didn't know that either until I read this article. It's really interesting what they're doing there is that there's a, um, um, a harbour bridge weighs around about, what, 52,800 tonnes. It's been looked after um, a crew full time. And in the upkeep of the bridge, this crew is looking for a maintenance defects such as rust or concrete cracks and things of that nature they also do visual inspections right yeah so over the last few years um they've been using some sort of edge computing network with 20 2400 sensors which measure uh vibrations in the metal um they also apply machine learning algorithms to these sensors um to alert uh, the bridge crew of any issues before they actually happen now, things like cracks on the surface, um, the crew can normally identify faults even sooner um, 
uh, like months before they actually occur with this sort of this device. Yeah, yeah, that that's pretty good. I suppose, uh, I suppose, like when you look at the bridge, like I look, I pulled this picture up here. That was on part of the story. It's a picture of the underneath of the bridge. It's just, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing structure, isn't it? Like it's, uh, what, what is that? Like one point six miles long or something like that or 1.6 k long it's just such, such a huge long bridge and it's just got no uh no support underneath it's all supported by the the the, the frame isn't it the the way that it's arched and that's 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 just how it's supported it's just a it's a pretty amazing structure and uh yeah like little sensors that's all good i know it takes hogs a year to paint it what well, used to and um yeah so uh, apparently this is a grip um, they call themselves the Data 61. They've developed a small um, little device that consists of um, accelerometers and a small Linux box um, with, a, with, a, with the processor in it. The group actually attached these units to the arches, one per arch with oh. some sort of epoxy glue. Yeah, right. It's probably a little uh, um, Raspberry Pi. It could be. I mean, I don't know. It doesn't actually specify what type of device it was. Um, but there, they, they glued it on with the epoxy, epoxy glue and they linked them up with a daisy chain type of eth Ethernet network and mm -hmm. they ran 1.2 kilometres of, um, I guess that's how, how long it probably is, 1.2 kilometres. Uh, yeah, that'd be about uh, it, yeah. Yeah, 1.2 kilometres of um, fibre optic uh, backbone. Yeah, right, right. So what they do is that they've got some on-site servers there at the moment which are network controlled. Um, they actually um, monitor any data um, and they collect the, the, the information and transfer it back to the company's um, data centre in Redfern. Yeah, nice. It's, a, it's, yeah. A, it's a, like a big industrial bloody, you know, steel construction, but it's got all this little tech on every, what, what every beam or something, did you say? Every bloody something or other? Yeah, it's got, a, it's got these... Um, on on the arches yeah little little linux machine on every arch that's cool yeah so the other thing as well is that um these things there what they do is they measure the vibrations uh, of things and if there's anything physically changes in the vibration of the signals um then it it, it, it alerts them to that it's for example like a bus goes over the bridge um it, it injects a bit of energy and it causes some vibration yeah. in the um, in the arch. So what it does is that they know that there's a bus going over, um, and they sort of keep an eye and see how that how that works, as compared to if the bridge is actually uh, starting to crack. Other than for you know, I oh, know that was a bus going past. We don't have to worry about it. Yeah. But if there was no bus had gone past and they start seeing some sort of um, movement happening, then it alerts them. Um, to, yeah. um, to to have a closer look at things. The things are the, the things eighty years old. So that's that's right. That's good, isn't it? That's um yeah, it's a, it's amazing. It's a, a very iconic structure. So mm. it's, it's good to know it's in, in good tech hands. They needed all that technology back in the day when the Westgate Bridge split in two. Yeah, well that's right. Well, so what what they've also got, and a lot of people don't know, is they've got this thing called Croc C R O C. And what that is, it um, has magnetic feet and it wiggles through the inside of the bridge structure, much like a worm. Right. And it captures a high definition video and sends the video back to um, base to make an assessment of how the paint and how the steel condition actually looks like. So they, they, don't, they don't actually even have to climb the bridge much anymore now. They don't, you know, might have to do it maybe a couple of times a year, where they've got these little croc, croc robots you know, with magnetic feet reeling around all over the place, checking the of the bridge. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I've just been looking for a video uh, of the of the croc, <laughs> but I couldn't find one. I could see it from not from the Sydney Harbour Bridge, but there's um there's ones for other bridges. Apparently, best video of a oh, crocodile bridge, Costa Rica's croc bridge. No, that doesn't seem what it is. Oh, there should be a, should be a video there on that. On that link that I gave you, there might be a, a link on the, right towards the bottom where it says "croc." Oh, let's have a look. I'd like to see if there is a see what this little thing looks like. Uh, yeah. So basically, people think that you know people just 
you know, the Harbour Bridge is just there, but there's actually a bit of technology behind it. And, and I reckon that's amazing, you know, like you, you have to have something like that. Like Jordan was saying, you know, that bridge that came down, they would have identified it, you know, days, weeks or whatever, months beforehand perhaps, and could have done something about it. Yeah. Well, oh, maybe back then. <laughs> that was a long time ago when the West Cape Bridge. But there yeah, a- of course. But if they had some sort of technology, you know, like, Back in the day, maybe. Yeah. There was a bridge over in America just recently. Was it America that collapsed? Was that America? Or Italy or somewhere. I don't know where it was, but a, 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 a road bridge and just collapsed and just killed hundreds of people. So, yeah, that, they, they, yeah, so it's good. Technology is good. It can help, help things. So, um, yeah, excellent, excellent stuff. Uh, what else have I got, actually? Uh, WikiLeaks spills the locations of the Amazon Web Server's data center all around the world. So if you ever want to know where your data is, just go to WikiLeaks and have a look. They'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> WikiLeaks has published a document that reveals the location of data center, yeah, Amazon, uh, at, at around the time of 2015. Let me just get this uh, this link so people on the YouTube can have a look at something while I, while I bang on about something else. There we go. Uh, eight data centers in Sydney are listed in the document, with six being co-location sites. Uh, two sites operated by AWS itself. WikiLeaks has published the full addresses and names and phone numbers of contact people at facilities. Now, the two uh, AWS data centers are the SID 51 in Eastern Creek and SID 52 in Smeaton Grange towards Campbelltown. So there you go. And uh, WikiLeaks was kind enough to also offer a map. And I'll show you the map of... <laughs> They put well, it all. Yeah, they put it all together for us. So you don't, you don't have to do too much work. Oh, what else has Julian got to do? Stuck over there in the Ecuadorian embassy. So there you go. There's there's a map. How's that? Hang on, see if I can get the full. There you go. Okay, where's the Sydney ones? So click on Sydney. There you go. Go for a drive on the weekend. Can not have a look at them? <laughs> But I can't see the big... Oh God, I, initially, I couldn't see the big hoo-ha. But anyway, uh, WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks editor-in-chief justified the release on the grounds that it is important for the public to know where their data is stored. It should not be clouded in mystery. This is of increased importance when the company in question is contending for a billion dollar... Yeah, blah, blah, blah. So... Um, yeah, right. ulterior motors. Yeah, like, I don't know. Do, do, do you really there's care? Always a, there's always a reason why. Do you really care? Like, if okay, you care where your data could be stored uh continent wise you might want your data in australia but do you really then want to do you care about drilling down to find the actual street address of it you're not not as if you can walk in and take it out <laughs> anyway so well, some people like to know exactly where it is obviously some people julian does i mean there's people like me who don't even like to store it on these big businesses places but i guess the only thing i could think about was what now that everyone knows about it what are they going to be you know I don't know, say potentially bombed, you know, and upset everything. But I guess if you're gonna, if you wanted to bomb a, a data center, you, I'm sure you'd be able to find out the address. It wouldn't be that top secret, would it? Is it all underground? It all gets. Smart. I would have thought for hackers that the IP address would be more important than the actual physical address. Yeah, but but anyway, that's uh, that's all out in the in the wild, thanks to old Julian. So he's still over there, isn't he? I think he's still he's still not getting out. They were going to cut his internet at some stage. They probably they haven't yet, I don't suppose. <laughs> but anyway, obviously not. He's still releasing stuff. Where are you storing your data these days, Glenn? Are you still are you still using iCloud or whatever it is? No, iCloud, no. No, I use AWS. Yeah. In Sydney. Uh yeah. You know the street address? <laughs> I do now. <laughs> I'm gonna go and pay it a visit on next holidays. Go and see if it's still there? Yeah, I'll go and say hello. Whether whether they're just pretending it's there and charging you for it? Yeah, go and say hello, see what the facility looks like. Oh, I guess out of interest sake, I would. If I was down in Sydney and close by, I wouldn't make a special trip of it. But if I was close by to one, I could possibly, you know, just take a you drive. Know, you're not going to go and knock on the door and go, can you show me the server that my data's so stored on? I want to see if it's all right. Oh, I bet you some people would do that, eh? Some, I bet you that some people would. They go, Where, where's my data? Can you show me the exact position, please? Oh, yeah. I want to know where it's plugged in. What power point's it plugged into? Oh, jeez. They won't um, even get that far. Not no, no, that's right. They'd be no. Um, I thought you'd be using uh, uh, what do you call it? Duplicatey by now, or Katie? Duplicatey. Oh. I keep saying Katie. Look, I haven't even got back to that yet. <laughs> oh, Freeness. You haven't got your Freeness working properly yet. I did get it working. Yes. 
I did. You did get it working. Yes, I fixed it. I fixed it. Um, it was Taking a, you long enough. I know, and because I thought it was a dodgy, a dodgy boot drive. Because I bought this dodgy one, dodgy small SSD off eBay, and then as soon as I put it in, about three days later, it started failing again. And yeah, I'll, that was at my recommendation, wasn't it? I know, Oops. bloody Jordan. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, I'll, you know, I'll get to that. It's only the boot drive. I'll get to that. I'll get to that. I'll get to that. And, and then, then you went and bought a bigger boot drive? Is that right? No, when I, when I looked into it, uh, it was actually one of the data drives that had failed. Yeah. And uh, so I replaced the data drive, and she's been humming along ever since. Yeah, so I'm happy. So how, when it failed, what you couldn't just you couldn't just reformat it or repetition it or something. It was actually and it and it had it drive. Oh, uh, I just chuck them out. I don't even bother. I don't chuck, even bother. No. Well, why? Why would you? Like, it's got your data on it. I just think what? How yeah, big was it? Was it an old drive or a newer was, drive or it's a two terabyte? So, so it's not old, old, old. No, it's not an old drive. It's, uh, it was out of warranty. It's not like one you found in the cupboard, you know, that you had sitting there from 15 years ago or something. Oh, no, no. But it might have been one I had in the car for a while. <laughs> in the car, <laughs> driving over all the bumps. Yes. So what do you, you tell me then, what do you reckon the average the average lifespan of a hard drive is? Oh, I think, technically, I think it is about th- three years, but I reckon they go longer. I reckon you get you should be able to get at least five. Yeah, I'd reckon. I've got four, no, two terabyte Western Digitals in my Windows machine, and it's still going after ten years. Yeah, yeah. And you turn that. Oh, you can, but I'd have backups if you've had them for ten years. Like I I wouldn't say don't use them, but I'd say have backups at least. But in saying that, Joe, how how often are they used, and do you turn the machine off and on? No, it's just in, um, like, goes to sleep and they don't use it for a couple of hours. Right. Okay. So they're still powering. Yeah, because I had a. I Don't think, they say sleeping is bad for them? Well, that's what I was just going to say, yeah. Because as they re-spin up again, it puts strain on. Obviously yeah, not. but I'm going to use it for days. Yeah. Look, it's hard. It, it is, it's hard because I, I went with the free NAS. I thought, oh, I want to let the drive spin down, you know, just to give them a rest. Otherwise, you know, because otherwise there's six drives in there just, just spinning like n- nothing all day, all night. And, yeah, there's just two set schools of thought. One was leave them spinning. They're more efficient let them power down and then when you want them they got to power up and yeah as jordan said more strain on all the mechanics and everything i know with uh pc so you go for ssd and then you don't have the spinning yeah but you don't get the capacity but you don't get the capacity because it's too bloody expensive that's right there's cheap msy ssd um samsung drives Did i mentioned that last week i think so I, remember I think you might have mentioned something because i remember that. saying giving the tip to thanks to tim as well so yeah so i remember saying that so i must have mentioned it last week uh, but yeah, five hundred gig drives for about one hundred and twenty bucks or something. So that's pretty good. But it's like yeah, that's not bad for an SSD. But it's mm. like with a uh, PC. I don't turn my PC off. I'm not talking server now. My PC, I leave it on because the school of thought that I was brought up with, I guess, was the uh, same thing. You turn things off and on. The thing cool. The motherboard and all the circuits cool down. You power it back up. They all heat back up again. And that, all that stress, the cool down, heat up, cool down, heat up. Uh, it's no good for it. So, yeah, it's like my old man used to say back in the day when he was he used to drive cabs years ago, and he said to me, "They clock the bloody K's over into things; they go forever." And he said, "But they never turn the, the car off. Yeah, so right. they just keep going and going and going and going and going and clock them over. They never go cold. They yeah, never, they're always hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably right. Because anytime something contracts and then expands, we well, you've got issues, haven't you? You've got wear. Yeah. Well, you guys now are making me really worried. I mean. I've had those things in there for almost 10 years. and I, well, You I, should have a backup. You should have at least well, have a backup. Yeah, I, I should. Now I'm really worried. I, I should go and grab a couple of four terabyte drives and and replace them, I reckon. No, oh, you don't even have no, to replace, replace them. them. Just have backups. Yeah, just like, have backups. Just, just have backups yeah. and then, you know, replace them when they die. Use them up until they go. You can use them until they die. Just make sure you've got backups. Yes. Get yeah, on. well, I haven't got backup, no. Oh, dear. Well... I'd be uh, worried, then Joe. I would be worried. <laughs> so we know what Joe's doing tonight. Now, um, for the next couple of weeks, he'll be sitting up every night. <laughs> I, why don't you have something like this iDrive that I that backs up auto back up to the cloud? I think mm. I think when I first I think it's been about two months, isn't it, since I first got it? I think it's finally finally finished uploading everything. So um, yeah, after two months, it takes a while, but you get there. But yeah, Joe, you got to have a backup. Go and get a something, and just even if you just back them up, keep the new ones in the cupboard until these ones actually fail. But oh, Joe, back yeah, up. I know. I, I've been slack. I, 
and like I said, just because we've talked about it tonight, I won't even get the chance to back them up. You won't, be, you won't sleep over it either. <laughs> yeah. He'll be, he'll be thinking about it all night while he's lying in bed. Oh, I'm going to lose my photos. I better do something about oh, it. Oh, yeah. Are they server drives or are they just normal consumer drives? No, they're the Western Digital Blue drives. Yeah. So what, they, they, are they the good ones? Yeah. yeah. What's the blue? Yeah, the blue. you got the blue, red, and green, haven't you? I can never remember what it's for. Yeah. Oh, just the, the quality. The green is, isn't the green one the, the economical one or something or good for the environment or something? And then the red one's right. the... Yeah, the low power. Hmm. Yeah, right. Um, all right, let, what's, I forgot who we're up to, but I'll, I'll have one. I'll have a go. Now, I was looking through this Jeez, one. Facebook's gone wild since we've started talking about your backups, Joe. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. And, and Alan's really really given me something to worry about as well. Thanks, mate. <laughs> yeah, no way. <laughs> um, look, I saw one here through the week. Uh, Telstra has defended giving executive millions in bonuses. Now, this is also... So I read this one, and then I read that uh, Such and Adela from Microsoft gets a yearly... Wage is something like twenty eight million. I imagine doing that, eh? It's crazy. A yearly wage of twenty eight yeah. million. Yep, yep. What would you do? What could you possibly do with that money? Like, well, what's the what? Really, what's the point of it? Apart from the amount of tax that you're going to have to pay, what's the point of it? I guess, like you know, you get to that sort of level, and you think, well, I'm going to save up for a NFL team, or I'm going to, you know, you're going to save up for something something massive but anyway the, there's what, so many people in the world you know starving and hungry and need money and then you got people like that just, but you don't know he might give a bit so away. much money that they can't even they can't yeah. even use it but you don't know what he does with it so probably shouldn't uh diss him if we don't know he might he might give yeah. some away but anyway no, this one not, not dissing him in in person just anybody with that sort of money <laughs> yeah, there's that's more right. people, it's not just him that probably makes 28 million a year well what about this one then this will give you the irrits uh, Telstra was uh, the new scheme was introduced in Telstra this year that gives the Telstra board more control over how much executives receive in bonuses each year. So in the first year, the board decided the executive should receive a thirty three percent should receive thirty three percent of their maximum bonuses. So this equates to Chief Executive Andy Penn getting two point one four million in bonuses uh, for a total pay of four point five million. Though this was lower than his five point six six million the previous year, the poor bugger. Uh, shareholders have questioned Telstra's decision to pay millions to executives in the midst of the Telstra twenty twenty two plan, which is of course seeing a net eight hundred thousand jobs gone. Uh, aims to recoup three billion in earnings uh, left in the wake of the MBN. Telstra wouldn't be left in any wake of MBN if they had have upgraded and provided a decent internet service to the whole of Australia at a faster speed than, in some cases, like Garth from Aussie Max Zone at ADSL one. So it's their own fault. If or if they didn't pay their, you know, their execs that sort of money, they'd have some money to spend on the NBN. Well, yeah, but like when you hear of those sort of things, Gosh. I know, like you know, if they shave, if they cut their plan prices, you know, it's probably going to cost them more than the, what they pay here to the executives. But I mean, like next time you you know you pay your bill from Telstra and it's one hundred and twenty bucks a month for your mobile phone, you think, you know, probably forty of this, you know, for how much of this is going to an executive, you know, just for what do they do? Sit around and yik yak all day long. Um, the company has shed. Three hundred forty-five million in profits in the two thousand and eighteen financial year, though revenue was up three percent uh, to hit. So their revenue hit twenty-nine billion. Lots of money, lots and lots of money. But that's what that's what they do at Telstra, isn't it? Look, they charge a lot. They are the best, though. <laughs> you can't you can't argue with that. They are the best. Yeah, well, you get what you pay for. It's the oldest saying in the book, isn't it? You do, you do. You know, and over the years, I've you know because. Over the years, I've tried all these different internet providers. I get frustrated with one and switch to another and switch to another and you switch to another and then you switch back to Telstra again, you know? Yeah, well, oh. It's the same sure. with my phone. I go, oh, I'll try Optus and I'll try Vodafone and I'll try this and try that and I always seem to go back every time. Well, I'm with Audi. They're not too bad. Well, that is an Optus reseller. So that's not too bad. But um, the, the, I, th I do think the voice the voice quality is clearer on the Tel actual Telstra network. Um, but other than that, look, yeah, other than that, I don't really think about it from day to day, to be honest, now. It's just, uh, yeah, I just don't even think who I'm with. It just works, so used to everything, so it's good. Uh, Joe, you got one more for us? I do. Um, this is something that's new that's going to be, that's happening in America at the moment. Um, General Motors 
uh, are doing data mining um, in their cars um, for the purposes of car advertising. Now, this oh. is really crazy because um, in, it's just just a theory at the moment. They actually haven't gone ahead and implemented it. They have gone ahead and tested it, but they haven't actually implemented it. They reckon that they've tested um, the listening habits of 90,000 drivers in the Los Angeles and in the Chicago areas. And they said that they've captured some details such as the station they listen to, the volume level, um, the area codes that the drivers are, uh, are driving in. Um, and then they use that car's built-in Wi-Fi signal to upload this data to their servers. Oh, that's a bit dodgy. Yeah, look, I, I, don't, know, I don't know where this advertising thing is going. It's just going out of hand. The idea behind it apparently is to is the relationship between the driver to listen to and, and what they buy and then turn around and sell data, advertisements and uh, radio you know, from, from the data, from advertisers and, and radio ad operators yeah. as well. Yes, um, I think the first the first thing that I sort of would pick up on there is that it sends it Wi-Fi to back to base. Well, who pays for that? If that's your connection, you should be able to turn that off. You shouldn't have to be uh, forced to comply with that. I'd, I'd want to because you'd be on four G doing that, not wouldn't you? Or, yeah, or, I'd say so. They say that it's just a concept at the moment, and it's just theory. No one's data is actually being sold yet or licensed yet as, as gm prefers to mm. call it why don't, um, they, why don't they just chip our brains and be done with it you know? yeah look i don't know it's just it's this is something that i read and i thought you're got to be joking you know we'll barcode our necks yeah yeah just um just get us just get us actually involved you know just just do it physically <laughs> but yeah but you're right joe where's it going where's it all going Look, look, the only thing that General Motors says and the spokesman for General Motors, James Kane, says that the connected vehicle data is to help them develop more accurate ways of measuring radio listenership. Oh, bullshit. Uh, yeah, I ring a whole lot of bull anyway. That could prove useful to local radio stations and uh, the industry in the local area, which continues to lose territory and add revenue due to digital streaming services like you know, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, and uh, General Motors sounds um, sounds like you know, like they can they can do something about that. Maybe, I mean, the um, you know, everybody who gets in the car kind of there's a massive market for listeners there, isn't there? That's true, and 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 I get it, right? I get the fact it's, that it's, a lot of people are streaming services, but the, uh, you know, like Spotify and Apple Music and whatever else. But, you know, they've already got their own ads as it is, you know, so. There's well, a massive potential there. Someone wants it. Well, there's a well, thing, thing here, Joe, in that story of yours. According to research, McKinsey connected cars create up to 600 gig of data per day. Well, there you go. The equivalent of more than 100 hours of HD video every 60 minutes and self-driving cars are expected to generate more than 150 times that amount. The value of the data is, is expected to reach more than $1.5 trillion by the year 2030. So obviously that's why they're doing it. There's there's money in data, as we always knew. Yeah, but I'm, I'm guessing the, what, that last bit you read there was more to do with the fully automated car, mm, yes. driverless, driverless car. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Is is that a true though? Like, what radio station the cars listen to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera? Is that a true indication of how a radio station is actually performing though? Like, there, there, isn't there more people in the office or in at home than on the roads? Yeah, look, I, I reckon it's more of an excuse than anything else. I mean, it, I think I, I sort of get the fact that you know you got Spotify and you got YouTube Music and all that sort of stuff. Um, so therefore, your local radio stations aren't going to get revenue from that. They're actually, you know, I get that they're going to be a little bit in trouble in the sense of that, okay, well, if they don't get any advertising revenue, revenue then they're going to have problems, you know, paying their bills, et cetera, et cetera. It's probably, yeah, it's probably more geared towards, uh, say, like the Spotify's and whatnot, so they can then take that data and go to their advertisers and say, well, listen, we've got, oh, on any given day, we've got like 15% of the cars in New York are listening to, uh, to us. So therefore, we've got a 15% audience reach straight away. We know what people are listening to in their cars. So um, maybe they target, maybe then they can, 
you know, maybe through the internet, so they can then say, they can grab the IPs of the cars even, and then when Spotify, if it's a free account or whatever, they can probably push certain ads to certain places. So if you're in the car, you, you get a, I don't know, a McDonald's next stop ad or something, you know? Yeah. If you're... <laughs> that's right. That's exactly, that's exactly what it's going to be used for, yeah. Yeah, so the, the ads the ads from these companies are going to be targeted to what you're actually doing, whether you're at home, whether you're in the car or whatever. But I don't know. Location, location, location. It'd be good if you'd be able to code. I'd be I'd be all over it. You'd be just pumping stuff out like this all the time, wouldn't you? If you could code, it'd be great. Well, how did they ever, in the old days, you know, I never really thought of it before, but how did they ever judge, you know, like on, on the radio, who has the most listeners? Like, you, you, you know, you see things like, oh, you know, the voice was on television tonight and however many million people watched it, you know. Yeah. How do they how do they know? Yeah. Apparently yeah. apparently yeah. when it comes to television, they um they well, how gave, do they know with radio? Like well, so with they, radio how do they know how many radios are tuned into their channel at once. Well, the way it was explained to me by a uh, an uh, what do you call him so of uh, some sort of an engineer, uh, yeah. He said to me that the antenna at the radio station sends out a certain broadcast frequency right and cer- at certain amount of power now when more people tune into that uh, antenna the more drain sucks, sucks more power so they somehow know how to measure it by doing that okay uh yeah so we're back <laughs> oh i'm back anyway what happened then <laughs> PC. I don't know, but Glenn insisted that we continue. We're like, let's finish this properly, so rather want, than leaving me and Joe hanging there to do it. We didn't want to leave. No, we, we here at Aussie Tech Heads leave no one in the lurch. So uh, <laughs> I've, I've, I've rebooted. What happened was uh, I rebooted. I've had a freeze. My system froze, rebooted, told me my CPU was overheating. And so then I turned it off. I gave it a bit of a nudge, a bit of a blow, and uh, turned it back on again. It seems to be okay, but who's to know? It might turn off again pretty soon. But I think well, we, where we were up to, we're up to talking about the uh, ratings. That's right. And my take on it, this is how I think they do the TV and radio ratings, is that they've got uh, like the, who's this, Morgan people, you know, um, whoever they are, the Morgan Research Company. I think they, they might have, say, a few hundred or, yeah, maybe a few hundred people in the capital cities or whatever. And they've got either little devices that are hooked up to the TV to show them what they're watching, or they actually just ask them to write down what they watch and what they listen to, and then they just multiply that by a thousand, and that's how they get the big numbers. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Because you know when they do, uh, they do surveys. You know who who you're going to vote for and all this. They're not asking fifty thousand people. They're asking sometimes less than two thousand, and they just they'll just multiply it by whatever the ratio of the the survey specimen to the you know population of the voting Australia, and then that's how they do it. I reckon that's how they do it, but I could be totally wrong, totally wrong. But that's how I think. Uh, All righty, so I got one more story, and that is about we had something talking about. What were we talking about? Automated something or other before cars. That's right, the cars, the the cars doing the 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 internet and stuff. Well, Rio Tinto runs about 34 robot trains a day. Uh, it's scaling up its use of autonomous trains in the Pilbara following regulatory approval in late May. The robot trains now cover 290,000 kilometres a day. So the first solo pit-to-port journey in full autonomous mode was only back in July, which was not too far ago, a couple of months ago. But the company is keen to have the technology operating across 1,700 kilometre rail network by the end of the year. So in a production update, Rio Tinto said that autonomous mode operations have increased to an average 34 trains a day. Uh, that's equating over to, to 200, over 290,000 kilometres or 45% of daily kilometres completed in this mode. By the end of the project, 200 locomotives and 50 trains a day will be running uh, autonomously. And the cost of the project is expected to be 940 million US dollars, about 80% above the initial budget. They got the money though. But how's that? Automated coal trains. Oh, that's pretty uh, interesting, isn't it? Well, they've been talking about doing some sort of automated trains here in Sydney as well. Um, in New that's South right. Wales. But I think the unions had something to say of that. They sort of put that on the back burner, by, I think, didn't they, for a little while? Yeah, look, I don't know. Uh, there's just talking about it at the moment, but I'm sure they will implement it, though. Mm. 
Yeah, oh, look, it probably will happen. I'd rather uh, uh, maybe an autonomous train than an autonomous car. I don't know. I'm sort of getting used to it, I guess. But uh, but the trains, like I used to watch that on the Foxtel, there was a thing called Great Australian Railways, you know, and just the, the I don't know, the ups and the downs, the pitfalls and the challenges that these big coal train drivers face from day to day. And that even like a half an hour stoppage for whatever reason just, can just cost millions of dollars like apparently if that train just does not get to the port when that ship sails the ship apparently just does not wait for it it just goes and then you know it could be all hell breaks loose someone loses their job um you've got you know railways the lines actually bending in the heat and all this sort of stuff they've got to be replaced and oh massive operations you know and massive pressure for the guys that are doing it very interesting show very interesting uh and i'll just add another Another tit bit of information, if you're looking for a good show on Foxtel as well, is um, uh, Truck Night America, I think it is. Truck Night America or something. They, they, they pit about four four-wheel drives against each other and you know bring your own four-wheel drive, pimp it out, whatever you want to do, and see if you can beat everyone else in some sort of obstacle course, like uh, first one to push a caravan off a cliff and all this sort of <laughs> stuff. It's pretty good. It's pretty funny. It's a good show. Uh, all right, well, I'm done. So is that worth coming back for? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, what um, any comments on Rio Tinto, guys, or just that's just interesting? Well, and I'm not sure. People have ever heard this before, but they've they've actually got cargo ships leaving the states, um, and they guided out to sea. And once they're at sea, they're fully automated, and there's no one navigating these ships until they get to the other end where they're going to port. And then once they get close to the harbour where they're going to port, people hop onto it. And they uh, then they navigate that ship back in. Wow. So they're, they're doing stuff like that now too with cargo well, ships. I wonder how that they go like with pirates. They must all be just locked up so tight that you just can't get into them because there'd be pirates out there. They'd love to get a hold of one of those ships. Yeah, that's right. Look, I don't know, but I have heard it's of that very happening. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. It's all going that way, isn't it? It's um, it, it's sort of great. That they, I don't know. Maybe you know because you know we're born long time ago so it sort of grates against what what's logically normal doesn't it like how do you have a ship that just sails by itself like you want someone there to look after the cargo and all this sort of stuff but yeah, anyway. right. yeah, i mean it's like a plane i mean a plane is on an autopilot so but there's still someone there though yeah i mean there would be people on on board but the only thing is that um they they don't take control of the, of the navigation yeah. of the ship that's all oh okay yeah well probably work i suppose um, yeah, cool. All right. Uh, are we all done? Yeah, pretty much. I think, you know what? I think we should get Paul in next week. Yep. Paul. He's, give... he's the only one listening on Facebook now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a couple of other ones apparently, but we don't, we can't see anyone that's because they haven't posted, but um, right. we should get Paul. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. In the I'd... show next week, have him as a guest spot. doesn't matter if there's four of us, does it? Mm, no, no, just no, give me notice. Give me that more than an hour. So can you give me, Paul, if you can text me, I don't know, I don't know, Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe? But, yeah. That'll I'm be. happy to sit it out and let Paul come in if you need it, if you want to stick to three. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens. If anyone wants a break, that would be good. But, anyway, we'll, we'll worry about that this week. Actually, um, Paul's just posted a, a link to a story or something you see on Facebook there. Yeah, what's he got? Uh, Torture's rumoured to be... Uh, purchase nbn oh oh right well that's no good i wouldn't like that to happen because then they'll just start reaming us all over again well see the thing is this is this is the crazy thing about this whole government and telstra and everything telstra had the monopoly they owned and run everything as far as telecommunications was before then optus came along and said you have to allow optus to use your telstra network so they did so then Optus then became a competitor with Telstra and competed against them. Then they said, oh, no, we can't have this. We need to have some sort of um, control of what happens in our network because then they wouldn't give the government access to, to any, you know, theoretically you know, private information from customers. So mm. they decided they could build an NBN, the National Broadband Network run by the government, and everyone has to go through that. And now this? Yeah, I don't really? think, yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I can't. The government probably pretty desperate for this thing to start making money, but they they did it ask about tit, didn't they? They they started in the to make. Oh, I understand why they started the rollout in the country and all that sort of stuff, and and probably rightly so, because uh, you know those guys have been putting up with either no or ADSL one for too long, 
uh, and that's why I started out there. But to make a con- make a bit of a return on it, they probably needed to start it in the city, uh, you know, where more people would take it up. So it's a toss up where you where you think it should have started, isn't it? Where you where you sort of mind takes you logically or, or morally or whatever. But um, well, I think it's going to be all rolled out pretty soon. Twenty twenty, I think, is pretty much the deadline for everything to be happened. Just let it go. Let, let's just um, get on with it. I don't want to see a monopoly again. I want to see let, let the government keep it. That's um, you know, hmm. and let us all use it rather than Telstra take it over and then just ream us all over again. You know, like you, goodbye unlimited data plans. Goodbye under one hundred dollar a month plans. Hello. 200 unlimited plan well 200 dollars for a terabyte plan you know all this sort of garbage so yeah anyway, i don't want that but um yeah all right well good stuff thanks paul for that story um yeah so next week let me know if you want to come on and we'll and we'll uh we'll put your mug on screen no. yeah why not yeah we should give a guest spot to someone different every week that'd be fun hmm. all right good stuff uh there's nothing else well i don't think that we can do a really hot awesome outro now by uh glenn goodman oh a real hot awesome one i'll take my shirt can you off. do like a <laughs> do like a real flash bang outro and make up for the last one well you can listen to aussie tech Ed's on the aussie tech Ed radio 24 7 back to back aussie podcast you'll never be alone uh that's just download the tune in radio app off your cross platform on any device desktop whatever uh search for aussie tech radio there you go find us on the facebook.com forward slash aussie tech heads uh if there's want something you want to talk about put in the facebook post early in the week and off we go so just share it to us uh or just comment on something and so we see it and then away we go you can get us uh twitter at aussie tech heads at glenn goodman or at the aussie tech news which will put probably two or three little news stories into your twitter feed every half hour if you get so so excited about tech news stories uh you can use the hashtag oz tech heads which no one checks but use it anyway i might check it one day <laughs> and uh yeah good stuff thanks to everyone that listens around the world uh every time i look at the stats there's people i don't know chili places like that are they just listening for fun or what do we sound funny well what's going on anyway, probably that's what we do they listen to us everywhere uh <laughs> So, yeah, if you feel like you want to come on, just bring a few stories. You need an external mic as uh, zoom.us. Go there, download that camera and good internet. Email me, Facebook me. Like Paul, he might be on next week. So let's, we've seen Paul before, so we might see him again. Yeah. Good on you, Paul. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks, uh, Joe, for coming in. It's been good to see you again. No worries. Thanks very much, Glenn. And uh, thanks, Jordan. Thanks for coming in. Good to see you too. Yeah, and we can all thank go, you. you. Thanks go, for having us. You can go and finish that beer now. Good stuff. I'm off the beers. <laughs> all right, good stuff. We'll see you all next episode. All right, take yep. care, and uh, it's goodbye from all of us. Bye bye. Good night. See you, folks.